Imagine you're running a vibration analysis on some piece of hardware that you're developing. And the hardware is on a shaker table which applies random vibrations to the hardware, and you measure how the hardware responds with accelerometers. This measurement is captured with a digital computer, and therefore what you get out is a finite amount of data that is sampled at a regular interval. Now, in the case of vibrations, as well as many other applications, it's often helpful to look at the spectrum of the signal. That is, to separate the time domain signal into the frequency components that make it up. And once we have frequency information, now we might choose to look at the amplitude spectrum, or the power spectrum, or the power spectral density. And each of these provides some insight into the signal that we can't get from the time domain alone. Now, with finite discrete data, like we have here, the first step to getting to any one of these representations is the discrete Fourier transform, or DFT. And the most efficient way to compute the DFT is using a fast Fourier transform algorithm, or FFT. And so for this video, what I want to do is answer a few common questions that you might have regarding the DFT and the FFT. I think it's going to be pretty interesting and useful, so I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. All right, so to begin, our first question we want to ask is why are we using the discrete Fourier transform? Well, the DFT transforms a signal from the time domain, or a spatial domain like distance, into the frequency domain. And one of the main reasons for making this transformation is because the features of a signal that we're interested in are not always obvious in the time or spatial domains. For example, here I have two time domain signals that are sampled at 200 Hz, and the question I have for you is, which of these has a significant 60 Hz component? It's not terribly obvious, right? They both look pretty similar. But if we transform them into the frequency domain, it's much easier to answer. I mean, it's clearly this first signal because there's this large 60 Hz peak. So we can use the frequency domain to understand the frequency makeup of a signal. To understand how the DFT is doing this transformation, we should look at the equation. And I know that there's lots of symbols here, but it's actually pretty straightforward. This blue variable, x sub n, is the discrete time domain signal that we're starting with. And we're going to transform it into the frequency domain signal, x of k. And to do this, we multiply the time signal with this yellow part, which is e raised to a complex number. And if you're not familiar with complex exponentials, this is equal to the cosine of the exponent plus i times the sine of the exponent. So essentially, what the DFT is doing is multiplying the time signal by a sine and cosine signal of a particular frequency, you know, given by this variable k, and then it's summing the result. And we do this summation for different values of k, or for different frequencies. All right, now I think we can get a little intuition into how this equation works with just a simple graphical demonstration. All right, I made a little MATLAB app here to show you how the DFT works. Here the time signal x sub n is just a pure sine wave with 10 samples. So per the definition of the DFT, we multiply this signal with e raised to an imaginary exponent, which I'm calling this whole thing the correlating signal, and hopefully the name will make sense shortly. Now if we set k equals 0, then our correlating signal is just e to the 0, which produces a constant real value of 1 and an imaginary value of 0. And when we multiply this with our time signal and then sum the result, we get a value that is really low. And mathematically, this is because when we multiply the time signal by 1, we get, you know, the exact same signal back. And so essentially, we're really just summing the values in our time signal. And there are equal positive values, that's these four right here, as there are negative values, which are these four. And so they cancel each other out to near zero. And the way that we can think about this really low value is that our time domain signal is not correlated very well with a signal with zero frequency. Now let's move on to a new set of frequencies, say k equals 1. Our correlating signal now consists of a sine and cosine wave with a period equal to the length of the time signal. And if we multiply these with x sub n and then sum the result, the value is larger. And we can visually see that the correlating signal is near the same frequency as our time signal. And so 
at least for the imaginary component, which is perfectly out of phase with our time signal, the product of the two is always negative. And therefore, the summation is also going to be negative. So there's a strong correlation between the two at k equals 1. And if we move to k equals 2, the correlation drops again. And this is all the DFT is doing. It's going through n different frequencies, where k goes from 0 to n minus 1, and calculates the correlation between it and the time signal. That's pretty cool, right? I mean, that we can think of the DFT as producing the correlation between our time signal and a bunch of different frequencies. But there's another cool way that we can think about the DFT, and that is as a rotation with matrix multiplication. If we go back to the equation, we can rewrite it as a matrix multiplication. X sub n is just a 1 by n vector of discrete time data, and the yellow exponential is an n by n matrix of complex numbers. And the first column corresponds to the sines and cosines associated with k equals 0, and the second column is k equals 1, and so on all the way up to k equals n minus 1. And now when you perform this multiplication for the first component of x of k, we get the inner product between the time signal and the frequencies at k equals 0. The second component is the inner product with k equals 1, and so on all the way up. So in this form, it's a bit easier to see that the DFT is performing this rotation between one set of basis functions, this x of n, into another, this capital X of k. And this n by n matrix is what is achieving that rotation from time into complex exponentials. And actually, this is a good segue into the fast Fourier transform. This matrix multiplication is easy to do if the length of the signal is relatively short. You know, if there's only 10 samples, then this is a 10 by 10 matrix. But if you're working with a signal that has thousands or tens of thousands of samples, then performing this matrix multiplication could become computationally costly. But it turns out that due to various symmetries in this multiplication, a lot of the operations are duplicated. And so you can perform a calculation once and then populate that answer in several locations. And FFT algorithms take advantage of duplicate operations to reduce the number of overall calculations. So they produce the exact same result as the DFT, just in a more efficient way. And for a good explanation of the FFT algorithm and how these computational efficiencies actually made the DFT a viable option for science and engineering, check out Veritasium's excellent video on the topic. Link is in the description below. All right, now that we know that the FFT is just an efficient way to calculate the DFT, I want to use the last bit of this video to answer a few practical questions and dive a little deeper into how we use and interpret the results. And the first question is, why do we sometimes just look at the absolute value of the FFT? Well, recall that the FFT produces a complex result. And the way that we can interpret this is that the real part of the FFT is how well the time signal correlates to a cosine wave of a given frequency. And the imaginary part is how well it correlates to a sine wave of the same frequency. And knowing both of these is necessary if you want to know the phase of the frequency in your original signal, or if you want to be able to reconstruct that signal exactly from frequency data. But if all you're interested in is the magnitude of the frequency, that is, how much of a particular frequency there is in your signal, regardless of phase, then you just have to look at the absolute value. So for many signal processing applications, like, you know, answering our 60 hertz question, you don't need a real and imaginary component to determine that. You just need the magnitude. So we take the absolute value to get that magnitude. All right, so for the next question, I want to talk about what the difference is between a one-sided and two-sided FFT. The answer involves understanding that the FFT returns both the positive and the negative frequencies, so two sides. And if you take the FFT starting at k equals 0 and go up to k equals n minus 1, then the positive frequencies are on the left and the negative frequencies are on the right. And the Nyquist frequency is the boundary between the two. This is based on the Nyquist sampling theorem, which states that we can only know signal information up to one half of the sampling rate. 
Now, sometimes it's helpful to shift the FFT such that the negative signals are on the left and the positive are on the right, but it's not necessary as long as you understand which are negative and which are positive. All right, so back to the question. If you're looking at the entire range of the FFT, then this is a two-sided FFT. Whereas with a one-sided FFT, you're just looking at the positive frequencies, just one side of the spectrum. And why would we do this? I mean, why would we throw away half of the information? Well, first off, if X of N is a real signal, that is, it's not complex, and we take the absolute value of the FFT of X of N, then the resulting spectrum is mirrored between the positive and the negative frequencies. And we can see why this is the case here. Let me hide the time signal so that we can just see the correlating signal. We know that when k equals zero, this corresponds to zero frequency. It's neither positive nor negative. But for k equals one, the frequency has a period of the length of the time signal. And going to k equals two, the frequency has a period one over two of the length of the time signal. And this continues as k increases. We get 1 over 3, and 1 over 4, and so on, all the way up to the Nyquist frequency. Now, I know that this is going to be a little hard to see, but if we increase k beyond this point, the frequency starts to decrease. And not just that, but the frequency is also negative. And we can see that a little bit easier here. Notice that between k equals 9, which is the lowest negative frequency, and k equals 1, which is the lowest positive frequency, the correlating signal is the exact same frequency, it's just negative. Now, you'll notice that the real component isn't changing sign here, and that's because cosine is an even function. So the cosine of a positive number is the same as the cosine of a negative number. But the imaginary component does change sign, since sine is an odd function. This means that between k equals one and k equals nine, the magnitude of the FFT stays the same, and the same is true for k equals 2 and 8, and 3 and 7, and so on until we reach the Nyquist frequency. Now, k equals 0 and k equals whatever the Nyquist is are both unique values that aren't duplicated anywhere else. So we want to keep both of those frequencies in a one-sided FFT along with the rest of the positive frequencies. So when there's an even number of time samples, like we have here with n equals 10, then for a one-sided FFT, we need to keep n divided by two plus one points in our FFT. And that plus one accounts for the Nyquist frequency. However, if we have an odd number of samples, say n equals 11, then we don't actually get the Nyquist frequency in the FFT because it sort of gets jumped over, in this case, between k equals five and k equals six. And therefore, with an odd number, we take n divided by two which leaves us with a half left over since it's odd, and therefore we round that up. So for 11 samples, the one-sided FFT would have six points in it. All right, we keep talking about positive and negative frequencies, but I haven't explained how the variable K corresponds to the exact spectrum frequency. We know that K equals zero corresponds to zero hertz, and I mentioned earlier that k equals one corresponds to a frequency with a period equal to the length of the time signal, and that k equals two produces two waves in that same period, and so on. So k up to the Nyquist frequency refers to the number of cycles within a time period equal to the length of the time domain signal. So if we want our spectrum frequency in Hertz or in cycles per second, then it's just k cycles divided by the number of seconds in the signal. Or we can write this as k times the sampling frequency divided by the number of samples. So we can plot the FFT against frequency using this conversion. Now, you might also hear the term bin width, and this is the width of each frequency bin in the FFT. So if we go back to the spectrum that we calculated here, bin width is just the width in frequency between each of these samples. So how far is it between sample zero and sample one, and then from sample one to sample two, and so on. And we already know this answer. We just set k equals to one in this equation, and we get the width between two samples. For example, I have this blue time signal that has a dominant 60 hertz frequency, and I have 0.1 seconds of data at 200 hertz. The FFT is on the right, and we can see that we have a bin width of 10 hertz 
and there's this small peak at 60 Hz. Now, if we want a narrower bin width, it's as easy as using a longer period of data, or just using more samples. Watch, as I increase the signal length, the bin width gets smaller. And we can also see that the 60 Hz peak really starts to become obvious. And this is because with more data, we're also increasing the frequency resolution. We're getting more signal per frequency bin. However, we can also adjust the bin width without having to add additional data. And we can do that simply by padding the signal with zeros. For example, if we start with the exact same 0.1 seconds of data, and we add zeros to the end of the signal, then we can see that once again the bin width is reduced. However, even though this is improving visualization, it's not increasing frequency resolution. We're essentially just interpolating the frequency signal and filling it in with more dense sampling. Adding zeros doesn't change the overall frequency resolution since we're not adding any additional signal. And we can see that here with our 60 Hertz peak, it's more like a little bump. All right, I hope that all of this bin width stuff is making sense. And I know we've talked about a bunch of different aspects of the FFT, so I think to help everything sink in a bit and maybe make approaching the FFT a little less daunting, let's walk through writing the code for a one-sided FFT in a MATLAB live script. All right, to start, I have this time domain signal. It's just a pure three hertz sine wave, and there's 40 samples sampled at 40 hertz. So I've got one second of data. So now let's build up the one-sided FFT. And first off, let's just take the FFT of the signal and then plot the result. And this might be how someone you know new might start, right? It's like, hey, I took the FFT, let me plot it and see what it looks like. But since the result is a complex vector, when you plot it, it shows both the real and imaginary components on a single graph, and it doesn't really look like much. So instead, we could plot the real and imaginary components on two separate graphs. However, for this example, we just want to look at the magnitude of the response, which we can get by taking the absolute value. And check this out. We have our two peaks mirrored about the Nyquist frequency, just as we expect. Now, to get the one-sided FFT, we just look at half of the spectrum. But of course, you know, since I have an even number of time samples, we need that plus one in there so that we can capture the Nyquist frequency as well. All right, so, so far, so good. Except now we want to plot this against frequency in Hertz. So we have K going from zero to N over two to account for the 21 samples in our one-sided FFT. And we convert that to frequency by multiplying it by the sample frequency divided by the number of samples. And finally, we can plot this, and as expected, the peak is right at 3 hertz. Now, you might often see that the one-sided FFT is scaled to account for the information in the negative frequencies that we excluded, but if your goal is to just understand which frequencies make up your time signal, then the scaling isn't necessary. For example, we can see here that there is a 3 hertz component in our signal. And it doesn't matter that the value of 20 at 3 hertz doesn't relate to anything specific. Now, scaling the one-sided FFT will be important if you want to understand a quantity, like how much power is in that frequency band. But we're going to talk about the power spectrum in a future video, and we're going to cover scaling there. All right, so hopefully what we covered in this video, each of these steps to get the one-sided FFT makes sense. And if you wanna try this out yourself or check out some of the resources where you can learn more, I've left links to everything down below. Now, don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any future videos. And also you can find all of the Tech Talk videos across many different topics nicely organized at mathworks.com. And if you liked this video, then you might be interested to learn about the Fourier transform in our video on the Z transform. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.